Welcome to Cryptocurrencies, the future of digital money show at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming an extremely popular guest, Mr. Alessio Rastani of LeadingTrader.com. Alessio is an attorney who taught himself how to trade by choosing his own mentors within the financial markets and has become an expert. If you've ever watched any of Alessio's mainstream media interviews, it's not a unusual for him to shock the host and the audience with what he has to say. So we are greatly looking forward to this interview. Alessio, welcome to this show. How are you today? Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, I guess just a couple of things to say about that, uh, which is that, um, yeah, my, originally I had planned uh, to go into uh, becoming a full-time lawyer and full-time attorney. Didn't quite work out that way because uh, fortunately I met some people, uh, some great uh, traders. Um, one of them who used to work for Goldman Sachs, a great, great guy. And uh, it just so happened that my career changed when I met uh, some of these uh, great traders and they, they taught me some of their strategies. I began to follow what they do. So for me, the financial markets and trading just became much more interesting. Um, and I should just say that even, um, even, the, uh, even people who've been doing this for as long as I have, you know, and to be honest with you, even experts, even, even people in this business who've been doing this for a long time, we, we have our ups and downs. So, you know, we get our uh, times when we get humiliated by the market. So, you know, just like everybody else, uh, we make calls, we make predictions that sometimes do not, don't turn out to be correct. So, you know, uh, I think that's just the way markets sometimes keep us human, keep us humble and say, look, uh, so we're all, what I'm saying is we're all learning yes. and actually learning never stops for people in the trading and analysis business, chart analysts and traders. We're all learning forever because the markets keep evolving. They keep changing and we have to adapt to those new conditions by all means. Um, educate yourself and learn if, if you want to learn about how to trade and uh, chart analysis and things like that. But just remember the learning never stops. Right. So. Even for the experts. Yeah. <laughs> we are so excited to have you on this show. I want to mention the founder of our company is crazy about your YouTube channel. Um, we are all big fans of you here because you combine the stock market with the crypto economy, which we believe is essential for success and leads us into our first topic. Alessio, for investors, stocks have a historical record of returning about 6% per year. And real estate can be predicted as far as profits go by rent and bonds have coupons. But cryptocurrencies do not generate a cash flow or have any average return to depend upon. So what is your strategy within the crypto space as an investor, are you buying Bitcoin or do you see the other altcoins as also being valuable? Uh, it's a good question. I would say that obviously the strategies you probably apply to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies may perhaps be different than those you might apply to stock markets and uh, say real estate. Although I'm not gonna go into real estate, that's a different topic altogether, but um, I think here's the thing, the key difference between, I would say, stock markets and cryptocurrencies is that just the, the price action is a lot different. People say, well, you can, treat, you can treat cryptocurrencies the same way you would treat the stock market, but I would disagree. From what, I've, from what I've seen, cryptocurrencies can often move so much differently, so much faster, more volatile, more parabolic than anything we've seen in the stock markets. Um, it doesn't mean you apply different, it doesn't mean your strategy has to be that much different, but I would say the one thing that you definitely want to have, the one thing that seems to be missing from a lot of people who are in the crypto space, in the crypto industries, uh, is that they don't, they don't seem to have an exit strategy. So, and that's because a lot of people probably are long-term investors, long-term holders, that's okay. If you're a hodler, if you're someone who's holding for the long-term, then you probably don't care about selling or getting out. But I know there's a lot of people who bought Bitcoin, maybe when it was much more higher, maybe it was, maybe it was 19,000 or 17,000. And they probably, they probably saw the 
opportunity in Bitcoin in 2017, and they lost some money along the way. And I think the big lesson is that no matter what you invest in, Bitcoin or stock markets, it's good to not only just know when to get in, but also when to get out. So having an exit strategy is really important. And I think that probably the biggest mistakes that people have made, and I've made this myself, but probably the biggest mistakes in any investor makes is that they don't pay attention to having an exit methodology or knowing when to get out or protecting their profits or locking in their gains. That's really interesting because that's the first time I've heard anyone mention having um, an exit strategy when it comes to cryptos. You know, in the stock market, you have that, you know, when it hits a certain place, you sell or, you know, if it starts to fall or, if, you know, you reach your your uh, goal. But um, so you believe in cryptos, you need one too, an exit strategy. If your strategy, yeah, I mean, if your strategy is to, to hold forever, buy and hold forever, then maybe no. Uh, if you're a long-term holder, then that, having an exit strategy probably does not compute or doesn't even come, in, come into the equation. But if you're someone who's looking to trade Bitcoin or if you have a more of a, shall we say, if you have, a, if you have the mindset of someone who's thinking, look, I want to know exactly when to get in and when to get out so I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't lose all my gains or I don't, have a, I, don't, I don't end up losing a lot of money, then you need to have at least some kind of exit strategy. I, I would think so, yeah. Uh, I spoke to a great trader, Peter Brandt, recently, and he said to me something I agree with, that the best traders in the world, they're not in, they're not in it to buy low and sell high. In other words, buy the very lows, and buy the very highs. They're just looking for that 60% chunk in the middle. So if you think about it like a sandwich, it's not about having the top part or the bottom part of the sandwich, the bread, the bread part. You just want to meet in the middle. And the great traders all know this, that you're not interested in knowing the exact bottom and the exact top. You just want to ride that move to get that chunk, that 60% chunk. That's all you want. That 60% that, that chunk is probably all you need to make a decent gain in the market, whether it's Bitcoin or the stock market. So if you, if you want to do that, if you want to do that, then yeah. you need to have an exit strategy. You need to know, look, if I'm, if I'm going to buy at this point, then when do I get out? And you need to know this before you even consider getting in. So that is really important. Right. I was just going to say it leads into the next sort of topic is how to mitigate your risks in an industry that can drop 50% overnight. So um, what sort of diversification do you personally have in place to mitigate those risks? Do you fly with a safety net? What do you do? It's a very good question. Um, I mean, there are different things you can do. You can hedge. So for example, if you have uh, if you have a long position, if you have a, if you if you bought Bitcoin and you're worried that it's going to drop, then you can perhaps think about maybe using certain strategies to short Bitcoin, or the shorting comes with its own risks too. But again, you can hedge out your if you have a long-term buy and hold position in Bitcoin, you could consider maybe hedging out some of those risks of Bitcoin dropping again whether it's using uh, CFDs or using, um, I don't know, other instruments like you know, futures or whatever, uh, as long as you know, as long as you're protected yourself, as long as you uh, have enough experience to use those kind of instruments, because they, they can be very risky. Uh, futures are extremely risky. CFDs are very risky. So you got to be careful. But again, there are methods you can apply to hedge it out or just use a stop loss. You know, you know, and for example, you can use a mental stop loss or a stop alert. As an example, if I'm buying Bitcoin, let's say, if I buy Bitcoin, let's say, at a price of 7000 then I have to know, look, if Bitcoin doesn't go in my direction, if it doesn't go up, then when am I going to, how long am I going to hold this for? When am I going to get out? And I want to keep those risks small. So a, long, so a trader would say, look, I'm going to put my stop loss or stop alert at this level, like just below, just below 5,000. Because if it goes below 5,000, then the risk increases of price going even much lower. So you need to apply some kind of risk control to, man, to, to, man, to whatever you do. And let me just finish with this. That is the difference between a gambler and an investor. Investors all know 
that the key thing about investing is not just making a profit. It's not necessarily uh, making hundreds of thousands of percent in profit. It's about, it's about no, look, protecting yourself against the risk and protecting your profits. There's no point making hundreds of percent in profit if you're going to lose all of it. So you need to have some kind of methodology. And again, I'll do my best to put, put videos on my channel to help people about this. But you need to have some kind of a trailing stop loss, some kind of methodology that says, look, here's how I'm going to lock in my profits and here's how I'm going to protect myself against risk so I don't end up losing a whole chunk of money. Exactly. Now, Alessio, what are some of the ways that investors can put money into the blockchain without actually investing in cryptocurrencies? I think it's a good idea to be diversified. Uh, you know, nobody really knows at the end of the day which of these cryptocurrencies is going to win out and be the future of money. It might be Bitcoin, but it might be something else. It might be Ethereum, it might be Ripple, who knows? It might be Dash. <laughs> so everyone has their own favorite kind of altcoin. But I, get, I, I think something you mentioned, Michelle, to me, and I think it's correct. Just be diversified among these different cryptocurrencies. At the end of the day, you can't, be, you can't go wrong having a little bit of Having, a bit of having your fingers in every pie, that's a good idea. As long as you don't, as long as you don't go heavily into just one thing, <laughs> which can be quite risky. Now, Alessia, some people have professed that they believe that Bitcoin equates to digital gold. What are your thoughts on that comparison? There's kind of an argument that people who used to be in gold, people who used to be extremely into gold, have now moved into Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Uh, that seems to be happening. Uh, some of the big enthusiasm that people had for gold in 2010 and 2011 seems to have shifted towards cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. But here's the, here's the thing. I would say the big, the big question for Bitcoin and any cryptocurrency that is going to compare itself to gold is solving the problem of the volatility. Because... I can put my money, look, any person who's watching this, they can put their money in gold and not be too worried about what that, what that happens. You know, the price, the price of gold is not too volatile. For the last few years, gold has been oscillating between this range between uh, 1,200 and 1,300 and 1,350. It hasn't really shifted in value that much in the last few years. That's not the case for Bitcoin. Bitcoin can go through gyrations and parabolic rises of, you know, 50%, 90% drops. So the problem is that if Bitcoin is going to become the future of money it, and people are going to feel safe about putting their money in into something like Bitcoin forever or use it as a currency, it needs to become more stable and needs to become less volatile than it is now. And we don't know. I, I don't know how that problem is going to be solved. I should say that a lot of people out there who are believers in Bitcoin, you know, the strong, hardcore believers in Bitcoin who might be watching this right now, for them, that's not a problem. Uh, they might be saying, who cares if Bitcoin goes up and down 90% or thousands of percent higher, but just the way it is, get used to it. But I would say that that's not the way most people think. If, if you're going to put your money, if you're going to put your money into, um, into a currency, uh, as, a, as, a, as something that's going to be a source of value and holder of value, I think stability and volatility is going to be very important. And that's going to be a very important thing to solve. And we'll have to see about that. Because then you bring in the fear factor too when you're investing in something and you're watching it become so risky, right? Yes, and that's something I, I do want to talk about, the fear factor. Often people say that as long as you hold for the long term, uh, that it's okay. So just to, to give you some context about this, um, I, get, I get this uh, from a lot of people out there who say, look, as long as you just buy and hold Bitcoin for the long term, you know, as a hodler, then it doesn't matter. Then you can ride out the storm. You can ride out the storm. You can ride out the ups and downs. Big deal. The problem is that misses out the key part of the equation, which is us, human beings. Human beings are not rational. We are emotional creatures. We are actually irrational. We make decisions not really that much based on logic, 
Unfortunately, we make, we make a lot of decisions based on emotion. And that's because our human brain, uh, the human brain is not really designed for investing. The human brain really was meant to be as, survi as a survival. You know, uh, back thousands of years ago, if you think about it, hundreds, oops, sorry, hundreds of thousands of years ago, our human ancestors were too much concerned about surviving in the jungle, surviving, uh, you know, in the, <laughs> in the caveman times. And therefore, our human brains really have sort of evolved to uh, adapt to those kind of conditions, not, not the conditions of investors, you know. And that means this. The same kind of survival mechanism that we have in our brain uh, for, as, as, a, as sort of fear and uncertainty, the problem is that the fear of uncertainty and the fear of, pa the fear of pain is the very thing that can work against us. So what that means is this. Uh, let me just put my microphone back to where it was. So, right. So what I'm trying to say here is that there's been studies, there have been a lot of studies shown on this by neurologists and neuroscientists that the human brain is deeply afraid of uncertainty. And that means it can make us make, it can make us do, uh, it can make us um, essentially prone to making terrible decisions. So for example, if the price of something, the price of Bitcoin, the price of the stock market is plunging heavily, usually people get out at the worst possible time. In other words, people get in at the very lows and they get, and they, uh, in other words, they, they sell low and they buy high. And that's because, of, that's because of the fact we human beings are emotional creatures. Our human brain, unfortunately, um, when it sees something that is causing us to panic, is causing us huge uncertainty and frustration and panic, we have to act. That's just the way we are. And usually when we, we get out at the worst time, that's, that's what happened with Bitcoin. A lot of people got out when, a lot of people probably got out when Bitcoin plunged to 6,000 and then to 3,000, mm -hmm. 3,100. And they're probably kicking themselves right now. Why? Because um, they couldn't help themselves. They saw their, they saw their life savings evaporating in front of their eyes, Bitcoin falling, you know, down to 85%. And it's human. We see we see these massive losses, and we feel, and that's not all. Then you turn on the TV, you turn on the media, you know, you look at your YouTube channels, your, you, you turn on falling. the podcast, and they're, and they're all predicting <laughs> even lower prices. Uh, so I remember when Bitcoin was falling to 3,100, there were predictions at the time that Bitcoin was going to fall down to uh, zero. I mean, that's what a lot of people were saying, saying Bitcoin's going to become worthless. Now, even if you didn't think Bitcoin was going to become worthless, the, the fear was there that it might be true. And the bottom line is that as human beings, we are herd creatures. We, are, we think in terms of the crowd. We look at what everybody else is doing. And when social media makes us worse, and social media, you, you, you're going on Facebook and you go, you're going on Twitter, people saying all kinds of things. Um, and it just builds, it reinforces that panic, reinforces that fear and panic. So the problem is that anyone who thinks that they can just buy and hold forever, they are ignoring the human factor. They're ignoring the brain, uh, human emotions, the way we act. So I would say if you're going to do it, if you're going to hold long term, then at least make sure you're disciplined. Um, read some books on um, trading psychology or investing psychology. Uh, and really think about, are you even, think about, is it realistic for you to even buy and hold forever? Do you have a discipline for that? And if you don't, and I got to be honest with you, I am not the kind of person, I, I'm not a, a long-term holder. I am not a buy and hold person. I, I, I have an exit strategy. So if buy and hold is not for you, then I would say educate yourself about learning how to, you know, learn, learn an exit methodology, an exit strategy. Um, so that, that's very important. Yes, yes. You know, um, Warren Buffett had a, a very or has a very simplistic statement that everybody's like, well, duh, you know, he says, you know, buy low and sell high. And um, it's a lot harder than what it sounds because when it drops, don't sell is against everybody's instinct. So it's, it's a, 
That is true. And um, it sounds very simple, buy low, sell high. But in practice, it's a lot different. Because uh, as an example, let's say you buy low. Let's say you're lucky enough to buy low. Uh, let's say you're lucky enough to buy Bitcoin when it was very cheap. Now, by the time Bitcoin hit 19 or 20,000, I can tell you a lot of people were speculating that Bitcoin would go to 50,000, 100,000. So who are you going to believe? You're going to believe, uh, my point is that that targets will change. And you need, to, you, you need to remain impartial, objective, and you need to remain cool. So, and I would say, and I would say try, to, try to tune out, tune out what's happening on the mainstream media and all the social media channels. You really need to look at the charts. And the smart people were those who didn't necessarily get out on Bitcoin when it was 20,000, but those who saw that there was an opportunity here to take at least a bit of profit. So even if you don't know exactly when something is going to top out, take a bit of profit, take a 30% chunk. There was a, I spoke to a millionaire, I spoke to a Bitcoin millionaire who made, bil, who made millions in Bitcoin, I think 7 million by the time it hit 20,000. And he took a 30% profit. He made a million dollars, even if it goes down, even if it went down, who cares? He made, he made a bit of profit. So you need, you need to learn. I think that people really need to uh, take seriously the idea of that, that buying low and selling high sounds simple in principle, but in practice it's a lot harder. So you need to have discipline and principles, some strategy in place as to when you get in and when you get out. Yeah, your strategy. And when, when you hit that moment that you're supposed to get out, don't believe it's going to double. Just get yeah. out, stay cool, be a cool cat. Okay. Now, Alessio, when you step back and you take a look at the general economy and you assess the situation as it um, where it's at right now, do you see it as being severe? Because many people take a look at the numbers, and we have a global debt at 300% global GDP with many trillions of dollars of debt being added every year. And we have an astonishing statistic that 70% of those trillions of dollars of debt that are added every year are actually going into entitlement programs, which is shocking. What is your view of this overall situation? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, now, I can't really comment about the entitlement programs. That's uh, perhaps for somebody else to answer. But keeping it, and I'm not really a fundamentals person. Uh, I, I mostly focus on what the technicals and the charts are saying to me. But um, there is a case to be made that uh, I think it is important to look at the debts, uh, to look at the debt figures. I think those things do matter. But at the end of the day, People like Warren Buffett and Peter Lynch, Peter Lynch, one of the great investors of our time, he said something interesting. He said, if you spent 13 minutes thinking about economic forecast, you probably wasted 10 minutes. And he's probably right. Um, and people like Warren Buffett uh, don't really pay attention to economic figures. And I think they're right because often the markets and price action will do something totally opposite to the fundamentals. For example, there were, in 2009, when markets bottomed out, when stock markets bottomed out in 2009, there were a lot of people who were saying, look, we have so much debt, we're going to be in a bear market for a very long time. And they were wrong. Uh, we actually bottomed out in 2009, sort of bull market, massively higher. So I would say that by all means, take into account the fundamentals and you know, things like debt and all that. But at the end of the day, you've got to look at the price action, look at the charts, make decisions on that. And one of the, I'll mention two pieces of economic figures I, I look at, which people might look at as well. One key economic figure I look at is the inverted yield curve, the, the yield curve between the treasuries, uh, the 10-year and the, the two-year, for example. So when that becomes inverted or goes negative, that can often signal a potential recession in the next couple of years. Just a few months ago, the in, there was an inverted yield curve, which predicted we might be going into recession in the next few years which is usually a good, reliable thing to keep an eye on. Another key, another key statistic to keep an eye on is what's called the, uh, the transportation index. The Dow transportation index has been a very useful and reliable clue to the economy because the economy is very sensitive to transportation. So the Dow transportation index, when it's lagging the stock market, is usually a clue 
It's usually, so let's give an example. Let's say that Dow Jones and the S&P are making new highs, going up, going up, rallying high. But the Dow Transportation Index is lagging behind. That's not making new highs. Usually, that might be a sign of weakness in the overall economy. So, uh, and usually the Dow Transportation Index starts making new lows before the, the actual stock market does. So keep an eye on the Dow Transportation Index, the, 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 transport, the transports. Again, another reason why we look at this is because if you think about it, anything that gets made by companies has to be shipped, has to be, many, has to be transported, whether it's by shipping, by airplanes, by post, whatever. Even things like tourism. Tourism is a key part of the economy. So when transportation, again, tourism relies on airplanes and things like that. So when the transportation index is not doing very well and it's lagging behind and it's dropping, it can be a very reliable clue. So keep an eye on that as well. That and, is uh, really interesting. It's a leading yeah. indicator. I would say it's a leading indicator. Yeah, thanks. Right. I've never heard anyone mention that before. But so what you're saying is the transportation will actually indicate what's taking place across the country before the numbers ever reflect it. Yeah, absolutely. It's one, of the, it's one of the key figures and charts I would look at. I know that there are some great market timers out there who look at the transportation index. Um, and sometimes transportation index, even if it lags behind, sometimes when the transportation catches up with the stock market, uh, that's a good sign as well because it means there's potentially more gains. So, for example, if the, S if the S&P is making new highs and the transportation is lagging behind, well, if the transportation starts also catching up with the stock market, that's a good sign there's potentially more gains to be held in the markets. It could, it could, it's a sign of strength in the market. So you, you got to be, so I would say it's a good idea to keep an eye on both. Keep an eye on the S&P, the Dow Jones, and the Dow transportation, all three combined. Wow, it's a, sort of a preview of what's about to happen. It's cheating. Absolutely. It's awesome. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> now, Alessio, do you consider cryptocurrencies to be a hedge against inflation or deflation or even against central banking or a combination thereof? And what does it best protect against? Uh, it's a good question. And again, um, I'm probably not the best person to ask that question because it's more of a fundamentals question. And yeah, I mean, I... I I understand. I've talked to a lot of people who are more knowledgeable and smarter in cryptocurrency than I am. And they would argue that, yes, um, I think it's a good idea to be perhaps invested a little bit in Bitcoin. Not, I mean, it depends who's answering this question. If you're someone who's extremely hardcore uh, believer in Bitcoin, you'd probably think you should put all your money into Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. I don't, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not like that myself. I think there is a good argument that perhaps it's a good idea to have at least a few percentage, maybe 5% of your portfolio in, crypt in Bitcoin and crypto, purely because we don't know. We don't know what they might do. And it uh, might be a good idea to have your finger in every pie, a little bit in gold, a little bit in Bitcoin, a little bit in the foreign markets as well. Um, yeah, as far as Bitcoin being a great hedge against inflation, there's a good case to be made against it, uh, be made for that. I think it's a good, I think it's a... I think there is some truth in that. Um, there, is, there are people out there who say that Bitcoin is the new gold and gold is old money and Bitcoin is the new money. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. I'm, I'm not saying that's true, but the bottom line is that it wouldn't do any harm to uh, have at least some partial investment in these. Uh, some, it wouldn't do any harm to have a little bit into every one of these markets. Uh, and yes, I think because Bitcoin is, it's, it's finite in number. It's not like, uh, for example, with, with the dollar and euro, you can print infinite amounts of those. So you can argue, well, uh, because the dollar can be printed infinitely, that it's, there is a problem with that. Uh, and therefore, it's, not a good, it's obviously not a good hedge against inflation. Whereas gold, which is finite, and same with Bitcoin, there are better they are better sources of hedging against inflation. So there's a good argument to be made for that. But they still come with risks as well. Um, I would say perhaps the stock market also is a great idea as well. Uh, so it's a, good, it's a good idea to be, to be diversified amongst all these asset classes as well. What does your personal portfolio look like? Well, uh, I personally, I think it's always a good idea to be... Um, 
I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a great believer in investing in businesses. Uh, so, for example, again, stock markets. I'm, I'm a great believer in investing in stocks. Uh, I've seen among the Bitcoin community, a lot of, a lot of people in Bitcoin seems to be, seem to be skeptical about the stock markets. And I understand that. But the bottom line is I think it's a good idea to have. So I personally like to have the majority of my uh, portfolio in the stock market, at least 60 to 80% in the stock market. There are some, some of it in bonds. Um, and yes, some of it uh, I'm looking to buy more potentially in Bitcoin and, and gold as well. So, and also I would say one of the things I'm also looking at are commodities. Uh, so, you know, I look at commodities like corn, soybeans, all these, th all these things like that as well. But the bottom line is that that is a question for each person to, I think each person needs to look at how best to be. Um, so, for example, if you're looking to build your portfolio, timing is going to be a very key factor. For example, if someone's buying at the highs of the stock market or the highs in Bitcoin, it doesn't matter how, how diversified you are amongst these different markets. The problem is that, actually, this is a good point I'm going to bring up. You need to also look at the correlations between these asset classes. <clears throat> so, for example, someone could have a lot of money stuck in markets that are strongly correlated. Like someone could be invested in Bitcoin, but also strongly invested in Ethereum, all these other cryptocurrencies. The problem is they're strongly correlated. So when Bitcoin goes down, it drags all these other cryptos down with it. So you've got to be diversified, perhaps not just in crypto, but also looking at other markets too. Again, gold, uh, stock markets. It, it, it's, a good, it's a good idea to have a look at all these different markets uh, as a hedge as well. So don't consider yourself diversified if you're just in the cryptocurrency. Yeah, and I would say <laughs> this. There are people out there, uh, professionals and billionaires, who don't think that diversification is necessarily the answer. I've heard some great investors, um, I forgot their name, I think maybe, maybe Jim Rogers, I, I think he mentioned this, that there are some people who don't think diversification actually is the answer. They think that actually you need to do your research and be, and be heavily invested in perhaps just one or two markets. And they think that that's the only way you're going to make significant wealth. They, they have a different approach. So I'm not saying, diversific I'm not saying diversification is the only way. Uh, people have different methodologies and strategies. Um, so, you know, it, it's a, I think it's a very personal choice to make. Um, there are a lot of people who are watching this video who only probably will invest in Bitcoin, and that's fine. Alessio, in your opinion, what is it that gives Bitcoin value? And do you feel that Bitcoin has some sort of a ballpark actual intrinsic value? And also, at this time, what's driving the price up? Is it the purchasing by Asians or Americans or Venezuelans? What are we looking at as an overall picture? It's a good question. And um, it's good. The, 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 again, the answer depends on who answers the, who, who's answering this question. Um, it's interesting that Jamie Dimon, uh, a few years ago, he said that Bitcoin had no intrinsic value. And apparently it's changed his mind now. He thinks that the intrinsic value, he thinks Bitcoin now has an intrinsic value of about $5,000. Uh, he, he thinks the production cost is its intrinsic value of $5,000 or whatever. Uh, people have different values for Bitcoin's intrinsic value. Some say it's $8,000, some say it's $5,000. Who knows? Um, again, I really don't know whether there is an answer to this question whether Bitcoin has an intrinsic value or not. Again, it depends who is answering this question. If it's a Bitcoin, uh, someone who strongly believes in Bitcoin as, a, as the future of money, they will tell you that it definitely has an intrinsic value and they, they have their own way of answering that question. Um, some people will say, look, uh, Bitcoin has a finite, there's a finite number. So as opposed to fiat currency, it has much more intrinsic value than something like the US dollar or the euro or something like that. Um, I, would also, or I would also say there are, there are some people out there who think that Bitcoin only has value because people perceive it as value. Just same thing as gold. I don't know if that's true or not. I really don't know. Um, 
I, I would say this. It doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. It, it probably doesn't matter. It's a philosophical question, and we may, not, we, we may never know. I would say let's just be focused on – I'm more focused for the moment on the price action of Bitcoin. So when I look at a chart of Bitcoin, my thought is not – does Bitcoin have an intrinsic value? My thought is, look, are we potentially in an uptrend or a downtrend? Are we reversing uh, momentum and trend in this market? Are we, in a, are we heading higher or are we potentially heading lower? That's the only thing that matters to me. And really, of course, we want to focus on minimizing risk, minimizing the risk and things like that. So that the thought of intrinsic value doesn't really occur because it can be subjective. Again, it, it depends who you ask. Some people think it's five thousand dollars. Some people think it's eight thousand. Some people think some people say no. It's none of those things. Uh, bottom line is, b bottom line is, I think that uh, we we may never know. Right. Highly subjective, really. And probably, in my opinion, subjective. Yes. I, I, I can't tell you. <laughs> and as a trader, this is a, a dream industry because of the volatility of it. it. It makes it not as stable, of course, as something like gold. But again, as a trader, it's wonderful. Which brings me to my final question. I mentioned at the top of the show that you're an expert in markets that are taking a downturn. And that you have stated that tremendous money can be made when markets crash. And so I'd like you to please just take a moment now to talk to us about what to watch for, what to do, and give us some of your best nutshells of strategy on how to really profit in a crashing market. I would say the best way to answer that question is, um, is first you have to learn before you can even consider making money or making a profit in any market you have to first learn and understand how to minimize loss and it's a kind of counterintuitive way of looking at it um, so the first thing i would say is be very careful you gotta you gotta first of all try to minimize the risk so you don't blow up all your money and blow up all your account which can easily be done even in, even in a market which is falling and yes you can make money but shorten the market when it's falling the problem is that I've known people who've uh, entered a market that's falling, but they entered at the wrong time, and they, mar they, they usually entered right about the time when it was bottoming. I remember there's a guy I spoke with who put his money into an ETF that was an inverse ETF, so when stock markets were falling. So basically, he went, he went short on the stock market right about the time when it was bottoming. And the problem is, as you can imagine, he ended up losing a heck of a lot of money. So it's possible to lose money either way, in, if the stock market is going up or down. But it's much more than that. I would say the first thing you need to learn is be disciplined enough, know how to minimize the loss, minimize the risk, before you can even consider making money. And that's, that requires a lot of discipline, requires a lot of experience and time. Uh, I know it sounds heavily boring, I know, but uh, there really no, is no way around it. The, I would say there's one thing I've learned, which is really important. Number one, you've got to be very quick to know when the market is changing its mind. So let's say you've done all the analysis you, you want to do. Let's say you've done all the chart analysis you want to do. And let's say you have bought into a market. Well, let's say you've gone short into a market. If the market changes its mind and if you go, if suddenly you find yourself in the losing position, you gotta, you got to look at the charts again and say to yourself, okay, wait a second. Is the reason why I went into the market, is that reason still there? There's a good rule I've learned which is, really, which is useful. If the reason that you entered the market is no longer there, if the market has lost its edge, if the, if the edge is no longer there, there's no reason to be in that market. you got to get out. So, for example, if you enter the market because you thought a bottom has been reached, and then the market turns around and goes below the level, kind of a support level. Well, basically, if the market is negating your reason for why you entered because you thought it bottomed, you've got to consider getting out because the edge you had is no longer there. The reason why you entered is no longer there. And that means you've got to change your mind. That means you have to admit you are wrong. So the key skill 
that you will learn as a professional trader is admitting you're wrong a lot. A great trader by the name of Paul Tudor Jones, he said, he said in the book Market Wizards, he said that um, every day he wakes, I think that's what he said. I, here's, I think I have the book over here. I <laughs> just said, Market Wizards. Go and read this book, by the way, anyone who's watching this. Okay. He said in this book, um, have you read this book, uh, by the way? Uh, no, I book? haven't. But now that you've oh. just suggested it, you can bet I will. <laughs> I would also say this, by the way, guys, that I, would, I know it's a big book, like, which might scare people. And I, I, I understand because I'm a kind of a slow reader myself. Uh, I listen to audiobooks a lot uh, because it's easier for me to absorb the information. I'm kind of a slow reader because I get distracted. I am too. <laughs> so I would say this, um, just pick one chapter from this book, any chapter, and just read it. And it'll, it'll get you hooked. Uh, just read the chapter from Paul Tudor Jones, for example. And he talks about his mistakes. He talks about how he lost money. He talks about how um, he made disastrous decisions. And we've all made them. I made them. Everybody's made them. And that's how everybody learns. That's how professional traders learn, by making big mistakes and learning from them. So just pick one chapter from this book and just start reading. And that get, that'll get you hooked into reading everything else as well. So, again, uh, the one thing I've learned, the one thing every professional has learned is be prepared to change your mind again and again because you're going to get it wrong. And don't be embarrassed about changing your mind. And thirdly, uh, be prepared to uh, take losses. Be prepared to take small losses. You're going you're to take small losses, and that's okay. And those losses can teach you important information. Um, so those are really important things that I have learned. I, I hope that answers your question. But again, just to go back to, to your question, before you can, can even consider, before you can even consider making money from any market, you've got to first of all uh, learn how to deal with the losses, how to deal with the risks. That's very important. Mm, your attitude and mindset. Attitude, mindset, information, and actually doing it, actually learning from doing it yourself. Mm. And I know you're a big fan of the charts over listening to anybody in the media. Uh, yeah, I am. I do pay <laughs> attention to what other charters say. I mean, I do keep an eye on what other people that I respect, charts that I really respect, I do pay attention to them. Uh, but even then, I got to make my own decision on the charts. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes my analysis may fall in conflict with what someone else might say, or what I might even think. I, I always say, make decisions based on what the charts say, not based on what you think. Uh, if the charts are saying we're changing trend or we're bottoming, then I got I got to go with the charts. <laughs> even even if it makes I might even if even if it means I might change my mind a few a few weeks from now. The bottom line is I got to go with the charts. I got to go with the facts. Yep. Um, and I would say this: if you are following someone else, and I do follow the occasional other market timers, the bottom line is that uh, I found. Here's one thing, even the best market timers in the world will get it wrong. And even they will change their mind every now and then. So if, if, if you can do what they do, if you, can, if you can be brave enough and be humble enough to change your mind when you get it wrong, then you're on the right track. That means you're on the right track to becoming a, financial, to becoming a professional investor and not becoming a gambler. Alessio, this has been an amazing interview. Please tell everybody about your website and your YouTube channel and how they can follow your work. Thanks again. Yeah, um, we have a YouTube channel, which is you, you can find on youtube.com forward slash Alessio Rastani. Um, and of course, you can find us on our website, leadingtrader.com. We put a lot of free information out there, both on, on our YouTube channel and also in our subscription base on leadingtrader.com. So yeah, um, again, uh, thank you very much for having me and um, I look forward to sharing more information with you guys in the future. Mr. Alessio Rastani of LeadingTrader.com for Cryptocurrencies, the Future of Digital Money show. I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.